the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. We begin today's show looking at the tiny Indian Ocean state of Maldives, where the country's first democratically elected president, Mohammed Nasheed, has been ousted in what he has described as a coup at gunpoint. In 2008, Mohamed Nasheed beat the longtime ruler of Maldives, Mamoun Abdul Gayoum, in the country's first free and open election. Prior to the vote, Nasheed was a longtime pro democracy activist who was jailed for six years. At the time, he was described as the Mandela of the Maldives. Once in office, Nasheed became an internationally recognized leader on climate issues as he urged the world to do more to save small island states from rising seawaters. For countries to defend Poland in the 1930s because it was a frontline state. It's very important to take, take care of the Maldives now because the Maldives and many other small states are in the front line of what is happening uh, to the world, to climate today. If you can't defend the Maldives today, you won't be able to defend yourself tomorrow. Ousted Maldives President Mohamed Nasheed once held a cabinet meeting underwater to highlight the threat of global warming to the Maldives. He also pledged to make the Maldives the first carbon-neutral country and installed solar panels on the roof of his presidential residence. Nasheed's rise to power is the focus of a new documentary called The Island President. This is an excerpt. If we can't stop the seas rising, if you allow for a two-degree rise in temperature, you are actually agreeing to kill us. I have an objective, which is to save the nation. I know it's a huge task. I've been arrested 12 times. I've been tortured twice. I spent 18 months in solitary. We won our battle for democracy in the Maldives. A year later, there are those who tell us that solving climate change is impossible. Well, I am here to tell you that we refuse to give up hope. Trail. The trailer for the new documentary, The Island President, it now appears Nasheed may be jailed again after being ousted from office by the police and military. He accused him of unjustly arresting a senior judge. Early today, Nasheed said an arrest warrant had been issued for him following two days of street protests against the coup. Police said on state TV Wednesday night that protests led by Nasheed after his ouster were, quote, an act of terrorism. Nasheed spoke earlier today outside his home. Issued an arrest warrant uh, to, to, to arrest me. Um, now, the new Home Minister has pledged that I will be the first former president to spend all my life in jail. So, um, he, I think he is working on his delivery of his pledge. I hope that the international community will take note of what is happening in the Maldives. And if they can't do something right now, it certainly will be late tomorrow. Why do you say that? We tend to work with facts on the ground, and tomorrow the fact on the ground would be that I will be in jail. So it's going to be difficult to, to rewind from there on, but it would be rather much more easier if people can start work now. That is the ousted president of the Maldives. We're joined now by several guests to talk more about the situation there, uh, and pro, uh, President Mohammed Nasheed as well. We're beginning with Paul Roberts. He served as Nasheed's communications advisor. He was with Nasheed on the day of the coup. He's joining us from an undisclosed location. We welcome you to Democracy Now! Can you talk about exactly what has happened, Paul? Yeah, thanks for having me, Amy. Um, let me tell you what I saw on Tuesday um, when I went into work at about 7 in the morning. Um, there was an almighty fight going on just outside the president's office by the military barracks where some protesters, I'd say about 500, had been joined with mutinying police officers and they were trying to break into the main army headquarters, which is all, also the armory. Later that morning, we heard that the, the military police and other members of the military were joining the, the protesters 
um, uh, calling for the overthrow of the government. Um, a little later, we heard that um, one of the ruling party offices had been ransacked by police, and then the national television and radio station had been stormed by police. The journalists had been rounded up and locked in a room, and the, and the cables had been pulled, and they pulled off the state television from the air. Um, but the, the thing that was most striking for me was at a, just about 11, uh, or I'd say just before 12 noon, the gates of the president's op office opened and about three sedan cars swooped in with a jeep at the back. Nasheed got out of one car, the defense minister out of another. He was surrounded by 40 or 50 soldiers, some of whom were armed. Um, and shepherded into a, a room. And I spoke to Nasheed this morning, and he told me that in that room, um, army officers who were carrying loaded weapons told him that if he did not resign now, they would use force against him and his staff. So he wrote a letter of resignation, which the military kept. He was frog-marched to a press conference to declare his resignation. Then he was taken to his house, where he was placed under military custody while the Vice President Waheed quickly uh, declared himself the new president. It was, it was deeply, deeply shocking. Well, uh, the, uh, uh, President Nasheed wrote a short piece that was uh, posted on the New York Times website Wednesday titled The Dregs of, Dis of Dictatorship. He began by writing, quote, dictatorships don't always die when the dictator leaves office. The wave of revolutions that toppled autocrats in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya and Yemen last year was certainly cause for hope. But the people of those countries should be aware that long after the revolutions, powerful networks of regime loyalists can remain behind and can attempt to strangle their nascent democracies. Uh, he goes on to say, quote, let the Maldives be a lesson for aspiring Democrats everywhere. The dictator can be removed in a day, but it can take years to stamp out the lingering remnants of his dictatorship. Uh, and he was referring, of course, there to the former, uh, the former leader of that country. Could you talk about the, the, uh, the ties, if any, between the protesters uh, and the former leader? Well, yeah, sure. The former leader was a man called Mamun Abdul Gayoom, um, and he was a, a brute, in, in a word. He led the Maldives for 30 years with an iron fist. The political parties were banned. There was no freedom of expression. Um, every election he won uh, with 99 percent of the vote, and his was the only name on the ballot paper. And Nasheed led a nonviolent resistance movement against him that ultimately ushered in the democracy, uh, which culminated in the 2008 elections, which Nasheed won, the first multi-party elections in the country's history. And now, the protesters involved um, in Tuesday's, uh, uh, well, it appears like it, the coup, um, were members of Gaim's party. But I stress again, there were only a few hundred protesters on the streets which in the Maldives isn't, isn't much. Nasheed and, and other parties regularly get a couple of thousand people to, to their normal rallies. So this was not a, a revolution, or neither was it led by the, re the rabble. It, it was a police mutiny followed by a mutiny in the military. Um, and it was, it was the use of force that uh, was something that Nasheed is saying that forced him to leave office. I wanted to go back to what Mohammed Nasheed said on Tuesday, the day he announced his resignation. The way I saw it, if I were to keep the government in power, I would have had to use excessive force, which would have resulted in a lot of people getting hurt, which is the reason I came to the conclusion I did. At the same time, if I were to have taken steps to sustain the government, there is a strong likelihood of external influences. During a short interview with Al Jazeera the following day, Mohammed Nasheed said he was forced to resign in what he described as a coup. I was forced to resign. You were forced to resign? I was forced to resign. And in your perspective, this is a coup? This is a coup. It definitely is. If you find any definition of a coup anywhere, this is a coup. This, this, is, not the, this is a bloodless coup because I did not take part in it. I did not want to defend. That is why there was no blood. Why resign, though? Even because I didn't want them to go shooting our people. And they were threatening? They were threatening me and they were threatening the people. So I didn't want that. And where do you go from here? Another election. 
and you're still hopeful. We are certain that the people of this country are with us. That is ousted President Nasheed. The State Department here in the United States has defended the ousting of President Nasheed and has confirmed the new leadership has been in contact with the Obama administration. Robert Blake, the Assistant Secretary of State for South Asia, is expected to visit Maldives this weekend. State Department spokesperson Victoria Newland was questioned about the U.S. stance in Blake's visit Wednesday. Are you going to uh, withhold? Or, I mean, are you are you taking any position on the suggestions that it might have been a military coup? Are you going to investigate that? Is Blake going to check that out, or do you think that that's not a, a, a sort of a reasonable suggestion here? Well, obviously, we're we are talking to all parties. That's why we're sending our folks down. But that is not the information that we have at the moment. But uh, Assistant Secretary Blake will have a chance to. Uh, be there and talk to everybody on Saturday. But in the interim, <clears throat> we are urging calm, we're urging dialogue, we're urging uh, the uh, President Wahid, as you know, has committed to forming a national unity government. And we think that'll also be an important signal uh, to uh, political factions across the Maldives. Well, does that mean that a determination on whether it was an unconstitutional change in, uh, in power is going to wait until after Blake's visit? Well, our view uh, as of yesterday, and I don't think that that has changed, uh, obviously we'll collect more information going forward, was that this was handled constitutionally. And that was State Department spokesperson Victoria Newland. Paul Roberts, you're the advisor to the ousted President Mohammed Nasheed, speaking to us from an undisclosed location. Your response? I think, um, in, in fairness, I don't think the State Department are being um, malicious or, or, or anything more than uh, an analysis on what the information they were given on Tuesday. It, it was a cleverly orchestrated uh, coup because the army effectively put a gun to the president's head and said, resign or we'll pull the trigger. And therefore he resigned. They then placed him under military house arrest and didn't allow him to speak, whilst the former vice president, Wahid, who we believe was involved in plotting the coup, was quickly ushered in to office. So from the outside world, who were unable to speak to Nasheed um, for much of Tuesday, certainly um, only at the, in the very evening so, uh, on Tuesday, it looks like a president had resigned, and as per the Constitution, the vice president had been sworn in. But it was only on uh, Wednesday when Nasheed was able to talk and some of his officials were able to flee the Maldives and tell the international community what actually happened, that um, the truth is starting to filter out. And what about the supposed pretext uh, for these actions uh, by the military, the government's arrest of a, of a senior uh, judge? Uh, could you talk about that judge and, and uh, uh, what the issue was in, that involved the judge and, and these protests that erupted uh, in response to that? Yeah, sure. This judge was he was the the chief judge of the criminal court, which is one of the middle ranking courts in Maldives. And the government um, had accused him of defending the former dictatorship of, of Gayoon. Um, there was a number of cases against uh, former regime members for embezzlement and corruption, and some some involving hundreds of millions of dollars. And the government contended that this judge was essentially. Uh, preventing those cases from ever reaching fruition. There's also been a I can hear you just Judicial now. Services Commission, which is a constitutionally appointed body to look into this judge's conduct, had also ruled that this judge was behaving um, in, in, in a way that wasn't proper and had asked for him to be disciplined. And the judge effectively was refusing to go um, and had even had quashed his own uh, summons by the police to come in for questioning. So at that point, the police turned to the military and asked for him to be detained. And, and you know, this was the, the excuse for, for some of the protests we, that we then saw. But I, again, I stress that the protests, while they were noisy and loud, there were at maximum four, four or five hundred people every evening. That's not enough to bring down the government. There's a hundred thousand people in Malé, and Malé is a a sort of a wealthy urbane community that leans very, very heavily towards Nasheed. And in fact, in the local elections last year, the Nasheed's party won nine out of the 11 seats there. So this was not a popular uprising. This was done by the security forces.
Uh, we're speaking to Paul Roberts, advisor to the ousted Maldives President Mohammad Nasheed. We're going to go to break. When we come back, we'll also be joined by the founder of 350.org, Bill McKibben, as well as the filmmaker who just finished a film called The Island President about President Mohammad Nasheed. John Shank will be joining us as well. Stay with us.